we're going to go to one of the questions uh, that was asked. We've, we've got two for tonight. And when we're done looking at this question, we're going to play another game. Uh, before I go on it, though, I wanted to mention something. Uh, so two weeks ago, I made a comment, and I want to make absolutely sure that everybody knows that I was not talking about Pastor Subtle, okay? So I made the comment that we could go back to having no vision or go forward to having vision. I wasn't saying Pastor Subtle had no vision. I wasn't saying that. I'm saying we are at a crossroads as a church, and we can either go backwards or go forwards is what I was saying. No, no jab intended. I want to make sure I got that absolutely clear before... Uh, we started actually looking at the questions, okay? So, everybody understand that? Yeah? Okay, all right. I say some stupid things, but uh, that's not one of them. <laughs> I did not say that. <laughs> so, the first uh, question we're going to look at um, is actually a series of interrelated questions, and I kind of just put them into one. Uh, is Second Samuel chapter 24 accurate? And the reason for this is because 2 Samuel 24 and 2 Chronicles, like, I think it's like 11 or something like that, uh, they, they, they tell the same story, but they have a number of uh, differences between them that have traditionally been called c contradictions. And so we're going to look at them just one by one. Uh, so first off is the matter of the census. In 2 Samuel 24, it says in verse 1, The Lord's anger burned against Israel again, and he stirred up David against them to say, Go count the people of Israel and Judah. So we, we looked at before whether it was um, Satan or whether it was God who incited David to do the census. We looked at that for quite a bit. Um, but there, there's just some other things in here we need to look at. Um, and and we, we decided that it was either God uh, using Satan or that they were both working in the same situation, um, just like at the, at the crucifixion of Jesus. Satan was at work and God was at work too. Um, so it was just a matter of perspective. Uh, and then we also looked at the possibility that there was a translation kind of issue where Satan in this context is not talking about a person, but rather the one tempted. So like an advisor was, was tempting David, or maybe it was just an agent of God. You know, it's kind of an unclear um, issue there. So go, moving on from that, um, we can ask the rest of the um, questions. And the first is this. Why was it wrong for David to take a census? And I, well, I want to kind of ask you guys, what do you guys think? Why was it wrong for David to take a census? Okay. So is there a way that he could have done it? I'm sorry, let me just repeat that for the live stream. Yeah, Melissa said that he was putting his trust in numbers instead of God. Okay, so it, was there a way that he could have still done the census without it um, being bad? I guess there's a way of saying that. Anybody? No? He shouldn't have taken the census or you don't know? Oh, okay. That's fine. Anybody else? Want to make sure we give crazy? So you um let me it's hard to hear you with the mask on. I think you said um if Melissa was right in that it being wrong because of he was putting his trust in numbers, then the issue would have been resolved by him just changing his heart. Is that what you said? Does anybody disagree with Melissa? There's another reason why it was wrong. Anybody want to maybe offer up a way of how it could have been okay for him to take this census? No, no ideas? Okay. So David was kind of more, more emotional about it. God was looking for opportunity against Israel. Okay. Okay. I want to point a couple things out, which I think is a very good point that Melissa made about it being um, uh, God was looking for opportunity against Israel. But uh, th there's a few things I want to point out here. And that is that the law doesn't actually ever forbid taking a cens census. A lot of people have said something along the lines of this. They said it's not wrong for him to take a census if God would have told him to take a census which I see what they're trying to say, but the law never actually says that you have to 
have God give you direction to take a census. It doesn't say that. What the law actually says is that when you take a census of Israel, make sure to have them atone for themselves by bringing up an offering, each of them, and this was the designated amount that they each bring. David did not do that. Instead, he just numbered them without having them give the offering for it. And uh, it seems like there was also an issue as to whether or not David commanded um, Joab to number the Levites as well, which I believe, if I remember correctly, that the law says not to count the Levites. But I might be misremembering that, but I, I'm pretty sure it says that. So if you want to look that up for yourself. Uh, the next thing I want to bring out is, um, so he didn't offer a ransom for, for the lives of the Israelites. That was a big issue there. Another thing I want to point out is that God oftentimes will look for occasion to bless and to punish. Okay, When we're living in sin, when we're doing things that we shouldn't be doing, when we're not listening to God, God will look for opportunities to punish and bring temptation by and, and bring us to a place of repentance. If, on the other hand, we are living in a place of seeking after God, he will intervene on our behalf where we don't even understand that he's intervening on our behalf. You understand? When we get to a situation we don't even understand, but God has already gotten to the situation and worked it out for us. And this whole big situation that could have been disastrous was worked out for our, for our blessing and well-being. It can be either way, depending on uh, really what's going on within our heart. So I don't think, in answer to that question, I don't think that the issue was whether or not he took, this, he took the census, but rather he, um, he didn't do it correctly. He didn't follow the law correctly. Uh, and David uh, did this, does this on a number of occasions where he'll do something, but he won't really follow the whole of the law, and, and this time it really got him in a lot of trouble. So another one is verse 18, and it says this in the Second Samuel account. It says, Gad, came to, who was a prophet, uh, came to David that day and said to him, Go up and set up an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Arana, the Jebusite. Now, if you read the same story in um, in in Chronicles, it gives him a different name. And so the question becomes, well, why... Why are there two different people? Who did David buy the field from? And I honestly think that this um, is an issue made more from our understanding of the event than is in the actual event itself. So it says that Arana was a, a foreigner. He was a Jebusite. So with that being said, they actually predated the Israelites being in the Promised Land. So... Um, something to point out with that is they didn't really necessarily share the exact same languages. So as a foreigner, for instance, um, there could have been numerous times that this actually has happened where there's more of an issue of translating the foreigner's name. You know what I mean? Um, translating it into Hebrew. Uh, and when that happens, you can get numerous spellings of the name. We actually see this happen um, in, in Kings uh, and Chronicles when it's talking about the different Assyrian kings or sometimes when it says different um, uh, Egyptian kings, it'll give different names than the official names because, once again, Egyptian doesn't tr necessarily always translate to Hebrew or Assyrian doesn't always translate into Hebrew. So there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of different um, things that, that happens with, with foreign names translation. But also there's two more kind of aspects of this. The first is that um, sometimes people had numerous names in the ancient world. So it's possible that Iran just had numerous names. Um, that's uh, possibly the same thing that happens with Moses' uh, father-in-law. And then uh, n another little aspect of this is maybe the names are related. So um, sometimes there'll be similar names that are related, and so you can kind of switch between them in languages. Um, y you don't see this too much in English. Um, I can't really think of an example in English. Um, but in ancient languages, this kind of stuff kind of happened very similar. There's uh, similar names to each other. And so you'll have the same root um, of the word, but um, given the different time that it was written or the different sources that they used, it can be come across to our English translation slightly different. Um, nothing really hugely that should concern us. Like, oh, no, the Bible is full of country, But it, it's more of one of those things to just kind of be aware of. So given all those kind of contexts, I don't really see this as a contradiction so much as... Um, probably just an, an issue with his name and translation. So, what? Yeah, and, uh, and uh, something else uh, to take alongside that, um, for those on the live stream, Melissa was talking about the way that C Katie couldn't get direct Hebrew tattoos in Jerusalem of the different people in her family because the names didn't exist there. Um, right along that is, is Hebrew doesn't even have a J. 
So like Joshua is a, is a, is a Hebrew name, but they don't have J. So Jehovah is not a Hebrew word. That is a Latinization of Yahweh. So what that means is, is Yahweh is the name of God, but that came down through Latin and became Je- Jehovah. Jehovah is not in the Bible. The Hebrews didn't have the J. Um, when you think of uh, Joshua, the, the actual how the Hebrew people would say Joshua would be Yeshua. They have a Yeh sound, not a J sound. Totally different. Um, so, you know, just keep that in mind. There's going to be a lot of times in translation where, where people say, oh, Jehovah, that's in the Bible. Oh, no, not, not really. It's not really in the Bible. You know, it's just one of those things where, where translation is a little bit, a little bit difficult, and if you're not familiar with the languages, it can really become kind of a stumbling block. So, okay, uh, the next little contradiction is in verse 13, which says this. So Gad went to David, told, uh, told him the choices, and asked him, Do you want three years of famine to come on your land to flee from your foes three months while they pursue you, or to have a plague in your land for three days? Now consider carefully what answer I should go uh, take back to the one who sent me. So in some translations and in some books, whether you're reading in Chronicles or Samuel, they'll say seven years of famine, and some will say three years of famine. Okay, did you guys notice that? And uh, there, there's some basic issues for this. Uh, so, so did God threaten seven years or three years? There's an obvious cop-out that like an atheist would give. So I'll give it to you. I'm not necessarily for it, but just so you're aware of it. This could be a copyist error, which happens. It happens. Um, when you have as many translations as we have, there's just some spots that, y- yeah, you're going to have run into some parts where there's errors. I mean, there's, you can't have that many manuscripts and not have errors. It's just not realistic. Um, so that absolutely could happen. Um, and so some Bibles have simply removed the seven and put in the three to fix the error. Okay, um, Not necessarily anything wrong with that. Um, once again, it might sound like, well, that's just being dishonest, but not, not really. Um, there's some things that, that make sense when you do it. Okay, So like if you start translating, you're going to kind of see how other translators think, and it'll, it kind of makes more sense, and I don't really want to waste time getting into that. But... Um, I think uh, a much of a better option is is that to see chapter 24 connected with chapter 21. So if you back up to chapter 21, it says this. During David's reign, there was a famine for three successive years, so David inquired of the Lord. The Lord answered, it is due to Saul and to his bloody family because he killed the Gibeonites. So then after this chapter, it goes into some, some records and details, and it goes to the story in chapter 24. So in, in, in this view, which is the view that I kind of take up, chapter 21 and chapter 24 are connected. So there were three years of famine, and David figured out that it was because of the, uh, wh- how David had treated the Gibeonites. So then after those three years, God yet again, as 24.1 says, God again was looking for opportunity against Israel. So it was in that same next year um, that um, would be, so think, think about it like this. Let me say it like this. You've got three plus three with the intermediate year, a, be- a grand total of seven, right? So in that translation, the seven years would have been the same three years. It's just a different point in that seven-year segment. So uh, it wouldn't really be a contradiction so much as one verse is talking about in the halfway mark, and the other one is talking about from the beginning. Seven years of total famine, including the three years you've already gone, or the three, or the, these people dying for three days. So you, so you got, you got kind of, um, think of it more of like a little math problem. Uh, another uh, option, which I don't really yeah, you you can you can combine it with the previous one and it's fine. And that's to see that to say that Gad came two different times to tell David his options. So originally he came when there were seven years, and then after three years he came again and asked if he wanted the three years or the three days, and so on and so forth. Um, so either way, um, there, there there doesn't have to be a contradiction here. There, there's plenty of reasonable explanations, and as I said, the, the most reasonable one is that. Chapter 21 happens right before chapter 24, so it's talking about a continuation of the, th- of the same famine that they've already been in or one of these other options, in which case the famine would hypothetically end. Does that kind of make sense? Sort of? Okay. Maybe I didn't say that one very clear, but you kind of get what I'm saying. Um, so then the next uh, little contradiction is in verse 9. It says this. <coughs> 
Joab gave the king the total of the registration of the troops. There were 800,000 valiant armed men from Israel and 500,000 men from Judah. Now, if you compare these numbers with Chronicles, um, they, are, they do not match. They have two different records of numbers. Um, so why are the numbers of the census different? Well, uh, my view is this, and you're not going to find this in other books. This is from my own personal research, okay? Michael's view, Michael's, <laughs> Michael's view on this, is that neither of the numbers are correct. Basically, um, the Bible accurately records Joab's lie. David sent Joab to number, number the Israelites. He did, kind of, and then he lied about how many there were, so that, that way he tried to prevent the problem. Um, it even says this, it references this as, as a part in one of the verses. So it, it seems very um, possible, very, in, my, in my opinion, probable, that um, the Bible accurately records Joab's lie. So there are other, other workarounds if you don't go with that. Um, for instance, uh, the numbers might have been rounded and then added together to give a guesstimate instead of an exact. Possible. Um, kind of makes you wonder why you would go to the bother of that because the whole problem was that he numbered Israel. So I don't, I don't know. That seems like a, a poor man's uh, or a lazy man's solution. I don't know. Maybe I'm just mistaking it. Um, another uh, solution is that the higher number could have included the standing army, which was not numbered. So the higher number in Chronicles is because it's including these numbers plus the standing army, army numbers. Um, that's, that's possible. Um, another thing is uh, jo- another option, which I don't think this one has any real real world basis, but it says, Joab says this, David says, go number Israel. And Joab says this, may, may the Lord bless Israel basically something along the lines of like a hundred times or something like that, you know, basically include, in, increase their numbers increasingly. Why would you do this thing, David? And so it could be that they took the numbers and then just multiplied it by hundreds to show the blessing of what would happen to Israel in the future, um, and that which case the numbers would have been more prophetic as far as the end, end uh, game of what God had for Israel's number. I don't really follow that view, but just want to let you know about it. My view is, is the one that it's, it's jo- recording Joab's lie. So in verse 15, it says this, and this is the last of, the, of these um, chapters. And you can see why there's so many different questions <laughs> about this chapter, because there's just a lo- it seems like a lot of contradictions. Uh, what, what verse did I say? It was tw- uh, 15. 15 says this. It says, So the Lord sent a plague on Israel from that morning until the appointed time. And from Dan to Beersheba, 70,000 men died. And the question here being, why, why was everyone else punished for what David did? Fair question. Let's open this one up for everybody else. Why in the world would God punish all of Israel for the sake of what David did wrong? Okay. Okay, so for those uh, listening on, online, Morgan is saying basically all sin um, has negative effects on people, um, on other people. Right? Okay. Okay. Anybody want to offer another view or, or build on what she said or anything? Grace? Okay, so Grace is saying because David was a king and they chose to have a king, so it came with the consequences of having a king, uh, like uh, Samuel warned about way back in 1st Samuel. There's there's the thought. So I I didn't really take that into consideration at all. Um what I landed on was because of this. So in the law, which I don't know if you guys have gotten this from my teaching yet. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a big student of the law of Israel. <laughs> of all the areas of the Bible, the areas that I know the most about are going to be mostly the law. <laughs> like, I, 
I know so much about the law. Well, if people ask me about other things, I'm like, I have no idea. That's a good question. Uh, but typically with the law, you know, these things. And if you remember way back in the law, it actually specifically said this about the census. It says, hey, if you do this with the census, I will bring a curse on the whole people. So he said that from the get-go. So it really doesn't matter in the law who brings about the census. It matters that there was a census, and each person was responsible for, for um, what is it called, uh, redeeming themselves. You had to bring that offering if you were going to be in a census. That wasn't something that um, was necessarily David's fault. It was David's fault to initiate the census, but it was their fault for not following the law under the census. Now, David did set the tone, but still they should have done something about that. Uh, and then the next thing um, uh, to mention is that nobody opposed it. Nobody opposed the census. They all knew what the law said, or at least they should have known what the law said. Maybe they didn't actually all know, but they should have known what the law said, and yet nobody opposed it. The only person who opposed it was Joab, the guy that was sent to number them, and he didn't even do it for that long. He opposed it, voiced his complaint against it, and they did it anyways. So... Uh, with that being said, if nobody stands up to do the right thing, everybody's guilty, right? I mean, let's have a real-world example. Somebody's getting raped right here in front of us. We all sit and watch and do absolutely nothing about it. Are you guilty? Well, according to the law, you are. (laughs) You might not like being guilty. You might not think it's fair that you're guilty, but it also wasn't fair for that person to get raped. So I guess we're talking about the greater evil here, huh? Uh, And so you got this this idea that, yes, it is somebody's job in the law to stand up and do the right thing, and they didn't. Um, So uh, when we look at all these different questions, we see that saying Samuel is accurate, it's just a matter of, ish, uh, of translation. And I want you guys to understand, understand this about translations, translation issues with the Bible. There are always going to be translation issues with the Bible, okay, because we do not have full knowledge. And there's always different room for translations. Sometimes, oh, this is the frustrating part about translations. You think of it like a code. Most people do at least, um, where, okay, you just put all the pieces where they go. That's not how translation works. There's oftentimes a, a, a area of tra- what the translation could read as, and you don't ultimately know. And so this is one of the things that caused a lot of problems, w- and we're going to lead, lead into the second question um, in a little bit here about this, um, is we had no knowledge, so we filled in the blanks in our translations with guesses. And so now what's happened is we're having to revisit some of those translations and say, okay, we were wrong. Now that we have more historical data, we know what that should read. So we change the translation, and people say, you're changing the word of God. No, 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 no. There were multiple ways that it could have been translated, and now we know which one is the right one, but before we were just kind of guessing. Make sense? So keep this in mind whenever you hear these people get real real heated up about uh, the translations and, and how they're, they're changing the word of God and taking verses out and stuff. Keep in mind that like 95% of that, well, 99% of that is just hoo-ha. It's not, it's not actual anything to it. For the last question, this was actually a question I did not want to answer, uh, and I had no intention of ever talking about this, but it was specifically asked, so we're going to answer it, okay? Uh, The question is, uh, did the flood cover the whole earth? Now, this, obviously, most people who grew up with Sunday school are going to say this, well, of course it did, right? Because, of course it did. But here's the thing. The... uh, this is one of those things where you can't really talk about it because if you do, people kind of get upset at you for it. So I just want to spear this off with there are two equally valid positions. Okay? All right? Um, there is one that I think is, is more likely, but um, it's not like one is stupid and the other one's smart. Okay? It's, it's not a thing. Okay? This is kind of what I was talking about with the whole translation thing. See, back before the King James ever was ever translated, nobody thought of a global flood. Nobody thought of that. The King James came out and put it as used words like global and over the whole earth. But before that, it really wasn't it wasn't really a thought like that. And so then, as English translations progress, we're always encouraged to try to match up with the King James. 
we're always encouraged to try and remember the roots, remember the traditions, and just try to side with that, even when it doesn't make logical, historical, grammatical sense, okay? We're still kind of encouraged to go back to the King James because just because it's uh, a classic, it's one that a lot of times people um, will read. It's one that uh, inspires a lot of church tradition, a lot of church thought. So we're, we're, we're always kind of told to, to, to go with, with the King James. But I want to absolutely clear that this is more of something that before that historical point in time was not really an argument, Okay, this is something that, that, that is a recent argument based off of an English translation. Okay, so just put that in perspective. The first equally valid view, okay, equally valid view, is that the flood was what covered the whole earth. Uh, so a big component of this would be Ken Ham, if you're familiar with him, or the website Answers in Genesis. Um, there's some other things there too, but so the biggest issue with this view is typically not so much the view itself as some of the ideas that are kind of pressed onto the view. So like for instance, they built this new um, life-size ark uh, of, the, from, of the Bible's ark, uh, you know, the Noah's boat, and I believe it's in Kentucky if I remember correctly. And in this life-size thing, they included a bunch of dinosaurs in it, which I think is just kind of silly, but once again... I guess that's more of just a personal preference kind of thing if you want to go that way with it. Um, more could be said there, but we'll just kind of skip past it. Um, and so this is one of the big issues that comes up with the flood is um, the issue of the dinosaurs. Another issue that comes up is the issue of the age of the earth. Just a whole bunch of other things kind of just get shoved into the argument. And so for that reason, it becomes not quite as simple as it should be. The other, once again, equally valid view is that, no, it didn't cover the whole earth. Rather, it covered all of civilization, which is a big difference and might not seem that important, but it actually is. So let's kind of break that down. First off, because this view is not um, very well received, it needs more time and attention given to it because most of the time, once again, if you bring this up with people who grew up in the church, they're going to stone you for talking about it. If you talk about it with people who have no experience in the church, they're not going to stone you for it. Most of you guys, if not all of you guys, grew up in the church, so this is going to be one that I'm going to have to explain a little bit more than the first view. Um, so the first, the, the first real problem with a, a global flood that this view addresses is that there's no real evidence for a global flood, um, really anywhere. Um, as far as when you look in, you remember on Indiana Jones, well, Morgan doesn't because she's a Philistine who's never seen Indiana Jones, but the rest of you guys who has seen the Indiana Jones, um, the, the Germans are out there trying to find the Ark of the Covenant. And they say this, oh, they're digging in the wrong place, you know, and they have the little laugh and the, da, 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 you, know, you know, with the monkey and the poison, you, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, well, Morgan, Morgan doesn't, but you guys know what I'm talking about. Uh, and that's kind of what's happening right now is people keep looking for evidence of a flood and they're just not there. And so they're saying stuff like, the Bible isn't true, the Bible isn't true. Well, no, the Bible is true, you're just looking in the wrong place. Okay, you're looking for something of a global nature for something in this view that was not a global nature. Now, there are some evidences that are kind of made much of. Um, one that you're going to hear more recently, especially online, is some, some different stuff. First is that there's the ark was found on a mountaintop. No, it wasn't. Um, another view is, or another thing that's often said uh, is that there's shells found on the top of some mountains, and that's that. It doesn't doesn't matter. Just you're going to hear a lot of different things um, that aren't necessarily accurate, and just watch out what you see online because. Even the things that are accurate, they're just kind of taken out of context. And it's important to understand that, you know, archaeology and these kinds of different things, it, it's, it's, it's a study, and you really can't just throw things in hodgepodge. But so now we'll move on to a, a biblical um, view against the global flood. It's actually found in Psalm 104. Now keep in mind, this is not a moral issue. If you believe in a global flood, that is fine. If you do not believe in a global flood, that is fine. You can believe either way without denying the Bible. 
I oftentimes deny the King James translation in areas. That doesn't mean I deny the Bible. I oftentimes will deny tradition. That doesn't mean I'm denying the Bible. So Psalm 104 talks about God. And in fact, if you look at some Bibles, it's going to say something along the lines of God the Creator on the, he- on the heading. My soul, bless the Lord. Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with majesty and splendor. He wraps himself in light as if it were a robe, spreading out the sky like a canopy, laying the beams of his palace on the waters above, make the cloud, making the clouds uh, his chariot, walking on the wings of the wind and making the winds his messengers, flames of fire his servants, which you remember was quoted in Hebrews. He established the earth on its foundations. Okay, we're talking about the creation. It's been very well established. It will never be shaken. You covered it with the deep as if it were a garment. The water stood above the mountains. At your rebuke, the water fled. At the sound of your thunder, they hurried away. Verse 8, mountains rose and valleys sank to the place you established for them. You set a boundary in verse 9 that they cannot cross. They will never cover the earth again. So the Bible just said that when God created the world, he put things where they go, and they, the waters would never cover the earth again. We could go on with the rest, of the rest of the chapter, but I'll just go ahead and stop there. There is a lot of biblical warrant for the flood not being global, but you're not going to hear about it most of the time because it's, it's in today's Christian culture, it's tantamount to blasphemy. If you would dare argue the point that the flood was not global, you don't have enough faith in God. And it's not an issue of faith. It's an issue of understanding that when the King James was translated, this was a historical thing. It was fantastic. It made the Bible uh, where people could get it again. This was great. But to say that everything in the King James is accurate is just, it's just silly. That's just silly. You can't have a translation that's that many hundreds of years old. It was done in 1611. 1711, 1811. 1911, 2011, or 400 years. And you mean to tell me that there's not a single issue with the translation. We didn't have the manuscripts back then that we have now. We didn't have, the, the words didn't mean the same things back then. And so you have one translation that is exalted, and I think that that's always a big mistake. There is no one single translation that I point to and say there's a perfect translation. It just doesn't exist. Even when I'm translating a passage myself, I weigh it against what a bunch of other translators said, and I take his, what are the historical views on this? What does the church believe on this? So this is, it wasn't really an issue a, as big as it's become after the King James. Um, another issue um, with the global flood is it's a problem of semantics, okay? And this is the problem. People in the ancient world, especially back when Genesis was written, they didn't think in terms of global. They, they didn't think like that. I mean, read ancient documents. They didn't think in terms of global. They didn't. Okay, when you read the Syrian Chronicles, when you read the Babylonian Chronicles, when you read all these different ancient texts, you don't see people talking global. They didn't think like that. Okay, now, obviously, the Bible is inspired by God. It can expand past the culture. Absolutely, absolutely. But there's no reason to assume that that's what's going on here. So the King James says the whole earth instead of the whole land. Do you know what's interesting about this is that word that's translated the whole earth in the King James, in every other occurrence except for talking about the flood, it, talks, it as, translates it as land and not world. Every other place it occurs. The only place that it translates it as the whole world instead of the whole land is in the flood account. Why? Why? Because there's a bias and a view that the, glo- that the flood had to have been global. Therefore, we have to translate as global. When there's no historical or grammatical, any kind of warrant for that. None. Once again, you can believe in a global flood, but you can also believe that the gl- flood was not global. Both views are accurate, or possible, I should say. Um, the next problem is more a practical one. There's no real reason to assume that it was a global flood. I mean, if we look at the Bible, it says that all people lived in one place. The whole land, and they all lived in one place. So why would the whole flood need to be global? Why should we assume that it's global? See what I mean? Like, if, if people lived throughout the whole world, when, well, then, yeah, okay, all right, you got me there. But people didn't live throughout the whole world. They lived in one place. So why would we need to assume that it was global? Um, 
we, we run into a plethora of issues, with, especially with the younger theory, uh, with the repopulation of the earth, with repopulation of the animals. It just you, you run into a bunch of different problems, scientifically speaking, and they are very difficult to answer. Not impossible to answer, but they just bring up unnecessary problems. And it seems much more likely that they really only took the animals from the area. The animals in Noah's Ark were the animals from the area that was getting flooded. So that when the flood waters seceded, they could put the animals back out and they could survive in the land that was just depopulated. That makes sense. But if you're trying to argue that the entire planet, think about this, guys. How in the world would it get from, uh, from all the come and say, well, God could do it? Well, yeah, of course he could do it, yeah. But there's no logical reason to assume that that's what he did. So I mean, like well, when we're talking about when we're talking about the creation of the world, we could make it super complicated. Maybe God made another God, and that other God created the world. And, but yeah, I guess we could say that. But why? Why would we say that? Like, there's no reason to make it more complicated than it needs to be. A few more things that I think are worth mentioning. Um, this is actually a really big one. So the, the tree that the bird takes a leaf from doesn't grow at high elevations. When Noah is in the flood, the water has covered the whole earth, you have a big problem because Noah sends a bird out to get a leaf from a tree, and the one that he gets it from doesn't grow in elevations higher than 6,000 feet. So how in the world did it get it from a tree at a high population on a mountaintop, I mean high elevation on a mountaintop, when the tree doesn't grow up that high? See, there, there's, no, there's no reasonable explanation for why you should hop to a global flood. If you want to believe in a global flood, that's fine, but there's no, there's no historical or translation dependency on it. You don't have to believe that view. You can believe it, but you can also not believe it, and it doesn't make you a bad Christian. Okay? You don't know how many times I've heard Christians going, almost getting in like fistfights about this. It just, this is why I didn't really want to bring this one up. If it was not specifically asked, I would not have answered it. Um, the way that, the, that this, ver you, mi you might be thinking, as I, as I was when I first became aware of this view, but the Bible says very clearly that the water went however many feet above the mountains, Right? Well, actually, not so much. See, once again, remember how I said that there's kind of a range of how, er, of, of how things could be translated? The only reason why we've translated that is 15 feet or whatever above the mountaintops or however, many, however it says how many cubits above the mountaintops is because we already established earlier in the chapter that it was a global flood. It makes just as much sense to say that it went however far above the foothills instead of the mountains, the foothills. There's no reason that that translation is not valid. And it's basically just talking about the way that that whole basin was flooded and Noah's Ark was pushed into the foothills of those mountains in Turkey. There, there's no reason to say that that's, that that's not accurate. And in fact, judging historically, that would make more sense. And there's a bunch, of el a bunch of evidence for a flood in that area. A bunch of evidence for a flood in that area. If we, if we take away the global fact and put it in that area where the Bible actually says that it was, there's evidence for a flood there. There is. Actually, there's evidence for a lot of floods there. And then it gets even better because you have almost a global record. Every culture on the face of the earth that I know of has an account of the flood happening. That means that they all came from the same source, probably. That's the <laughs> I mean, a lot of historians discredit this and they say, well, it's because everybody had the same fear. I have a fear of heights, and I'm a lot of other people do too. But you don't hear, hear a global <laughs> ancient <laughs> account of, of some height story. So assumptions were made in translation, and they were stuck with, and now there's kind of a, f a pressure to follow it. Um, in, in this view, you, you get rid of a lot of the different things that would cause a problem. For instance, the dinosaurs would have been long dead before Noah was ever even there, um, just like the Bible says about how God raised up and, and killed them and then raised up new life. Um, and then that would, that would resolve the issue of how old the earth is as well because it wouldn't really matter how old the earth is. The earth could be older than 6,000 years, and it really wouldn't matter. But that's a conversation for another day. Um, the age of the earth is a little bit harder to determine than a lot of times people on both sides know. For instance, um, who here can tell me whether the earth was made and created with age or without age? You can't answer that, can you? Because you weren't there. So how do you know, right? Kind of, this is part of the, part of the problem. 
Um, and then there's the issue, was, was the whole earth made in a single moment or was it made in time? Was it made outside of time or inserted into time? See what I mean? There's a lot of different issues there. Um, so my take, my personal view, if, you want, if, if the question is asking, whoever asks this, if you're asking what my personal view is, my personal view is that there is, it was not a global flood, but it was global in its prospect. Basically, it, all of humanity went through it, but not the whole world was covered with it, if that kind of makes sense. Um, I would also say that it is possible, I know this really bothers people, but in ancient writings when they say all, it almost very rarely means all. It usually just means a grand majority. And what I mean to say is this, it is very possible that some other people could have survived the flood. Not a lot, but a few here or there. It's possible. The reason why I bring that up is because the Nephilim come up later on. It's kind of a whole big story point later in, in, in the Bible. Um, it's, it's possible that they survived the flood besides Noah. So just throwing that out there. Um, anyways, but uh, yeah, so I think we can go ahead and stop there. So I think this is a very difficult question to answer, and I think that a lot of times people rush to a conclusion without considering any of the scientific, historical, uh, archaeological evidences for or against it. Um, so yes, you can be a Christian and believe in a global flood. You can be a Christian and believe that the glo flood was not global. Neither of those views makes you a bad Christian. Neither of them makes you untrusting of God. It's just a matter of how you interpret the evidence presented to you. If you believe in a global flood, I want to point you towards a valuable resource for you online. It's called Answers in Genesis. Um, they give a lot of retorts to common uh, objections towards a a young earth, and also towards a global uh, flood. So if you're interested, um, go check that out. Uh, Ken Ham also has a series of books talking about a global flood and giving different evident things he sees as evidences for it. Um, so if you believe in a global flood, I would strongly encourage you to go towards those things as a way of strengthening your, your faith. If you believe in a excuse me, if you believe in a more local flood, such as myself, uh, there are resources out there, um, but well, if you're interested, just let me know, and I can kind of point you in the right direction there. Um, any questions on any of the questions that we answered tonight? No? Okay. Uh, okay, so we aren't going to have a question in game night this month because we had to do now for last month. So it would be the last month of September that we have the next, na last week of September that we have the next one of these. Um, so if you have any questions, don't forget to put them in the question box. 